Uh, all right, so uh, my name is Leo Ben Guy, and I'm a computational artist. Um, this talk is called Exploring. Let's see that again. Uh, Exploring emergent structures with cellular automata, and I'm going to tell you um, what that means. So just a little bit about myself, I'm a computational artist, and that means that I study forms and processes using algorithms. Uh, unlike a scientist, I'm more interested in things like aesthetics and experience, um, interaction and exploration, uh, and less interested in solving problems. Um, but I, I often tend to use the sort of tools that scientists and engineers use, and I'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, I would say another big difference is that I'm very motivated in thinking of uh, like things I've never thought about before. I'm very, very much haunted by the question of what else is out there. And a lot of my work is focused into coming up with, I guess, other things. So just to give you a little bit of context, I'm going to try uh, a little test, maybe for the people in the room. One of these pictures was taken with a microscope and the other one with a satellite. Can anyone hear? Yes, which is which? Which one was taken with a microscope and which one with a satellite? Just. I will give them, I will give them the opposite. Someone, where is it? The left one? Left one is satellite? Yeah. All right, I let's see. Like the opposite, what, what is it? All right, so left one is microscope and right one is satellite. Let's do another one. Which is which? Right is microscope and left right. is satellite. Nope, the other way around. And another one, which is which? No. Nope. Um, and so this is a like a, a, I guess a short example of uh, uh, something I'm interested in, in, in how patterns emerge towards certain forms. And I think it's very interesting that very small things and very large things tend to collapse towards similar having similar properties. Uh, let's give you another illustration of, of a type of phenomena that I find very interesting. So this sort of flocking behavior that we see in, a, in birds. And so this is a classical example of emergent behavior where the form of the flock is, you know, it emerges from the interactions between each and every bird and together they form this very compound, uh, complex shape. But we actually see this very similar phenomena um, somewhere else in the sea, even though those are land animals and those are uh, in the sea. And we can also see the same behavior um, on land. Um, and these, behavior, uh, these behaviors, they have very particular attributes. So in 1987, a guy called Craig Reynolds, uh, he discovered, um, he sort of formulated this behavior as the sum of three types of behaviors separation, alignment, and cohesion. And when each member of the flock uh, does those three things in relation to the ones that are around it, that's when you start getting this sort of flocking, swarming, schooling behavior. Um, and so as a computational artist, as, as someone who deals with code, but for creative purposes, uh, what I would generally tend to do is to implement this kind of behavior, but my personal tendency is to start getting away from um, simulating things and just to think about it as abstract structures. So here, you know, this is that exact same behavior, but I'm no longer thinking of birds or fish or our people or whatever. It's just dots and lines, but they can form very interesting structures. And once you have that in code, then you can start playing around with it and you can start uh, manipulating the aesthetic aspects of it, and you can start thinking about it in very different ways. Um, it's all the same behavior, but kind of slightly mutated and changed around in order to explore a different type of behavior or aesthetic. Um, don't know if you can hear the sound, but generally, um, this is from a live performance, a collaborative performance I did where I use this sort of flocking behavior uh, to react to a live orchestra playing. And then it was sort of projected. So then it was sort of projected live uh, uh, um, to, to, to give an extra layer for the performance. And this is kind of very generally uh, uh, my, my work practice. I, I identify some sort of behavior 
and then I implement it in a computer, and then I figure out what I can do with it. So, um, something I make a lot of use of uh, uh, is a computational model called cellular automata. I'm going to very briefly try to explain what that is. So, let's imagine that we have a cell. It's just an entity. That's not good. I'm going to just continue anyway. Um, let's imagine that we have a cell. It's just an abstract entity. And you're not good. Oh, yeah? Okay. So, um, in that cell, before we imagine what it is, we, we might say that it has uh, uh, a state. So, that the, the, the state of that cell could be either zero or one. And we might uh, start a process where the state of the cell changes. So according to the rule that you see um, below there, if the state is zero, turn it to one, and if it's one, turn it to zero, and then it sort of, it starts fluctuating between them. Uh, but what if we had more than one cell? What if we had two, and each one is looking at the state of the one next to it? Then we start having a relationship and a presence of feedback. And when you start to accumulate even more cells with certain rule systems, you'd start to get very interesting behavior. Not always, uh, not always, but some rule systems might become quite interesting. Um, a very good example of this is a, a very, quite a large, sorry, lots of going on, lots of stuff going on here. Quite a large uh, study by Stephen Wolf from, um, and he did a, a, a sort of rigorous survey of all possible rule systems of uh, different ways of putting these cells in a row. And what you see here is them kind of, this is the first step and the second and the third. And when you, when you study about cellular automata, when you start reading about it, uh, you, you, you'd find this quite often. Let's look at a different rule system. This is the rule system uh, that we see here on the left. It's quite a bit more complex, but still very, you know, it's not long. It's not a complicated formula. I won't kind of uh, recite it here, but um, it leads to this behavior. And it may not seem like much, but if you zoom out even further, you'd start to see that very particular patterns are formed when you run this rule system, when you let the cells look at their own neighbors and then decide on which color they should have. And that type of phenomena, these sort of structures, uh, you, you might call them emergent structures because they emerge from the rules of the system. In nowhere in the program have I defined this behavior. It just happens from this very simple rule system. So again, this is a very common uh, uh, algorithm called the game of life. Um, most people know what game of life is well, long before they know what cellular automata is. Um, again, very famous algorithm. Uh, and another thing is you don't have to stay in black or white. You could also have gradient colors. So all possible values from zero to one. And then here, this is a rule system where it just averages out. And what you see is sort of the sum of all neighbors divided by nine. Um, again, a very simple rule system, but you might start to see how there are many more options once you start going, you, know, you increase the number of possible states. So this is called reaction diffusion. Um, again, quite a famous algorithm, and it simulates how two chemicals diffuse into one another. As you can see, there are very particular forms that you can get with this that are quite interesting. So these systems, um, I've, I've, I've kind of showed you only three examples, but there are actually infinitely many cellular automata programs, and most of them are not interesting, and they just end up being kind of this jumble of, of colors, but some are actually more interesting than others. And in the, I guess, 70 years of research that we've done about this, uh, you're almost likely to only encounter these three algorithms. Uh, those are sort of, they, they, they became this canonical examples of cellular automata. But my question is, where are all the other ones? You know, why aren't we exploring them? There are tons of more behaviors out there. Um, how can we find them? I'm sure there are interesting ones out there. So this is what I'm doing uh, sort of, time will tell if that was the right decision or not, but I decided to do a PhD on this. Um, 
And so I'm going to show you a bit about a, a, a bit from my work in that. So my process goes something like this. Uh, I would start with a known algorithm, what we've seen before, Conway's Game of Life. And what I would do is, you know, what I basically did is I translated, I created this sort of, um, I guess you would call it a functional programming language. I, I, I can translate it from a general purpose programming language into this sort of um, algebraic expression. And it would look like this in my uh, programming environment. And the nice thing about it is that when you translate programs to look like this, you can start modifying every detail about them and they still apply, but then you start getting new behavior. And this is, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of hypothesizing that this is an interesting way to come up with novel behaviors. So this is an example of uh, one of the first algorithms that I've found. And as you can see, it, it, well, I'll give you a second to just look at it. But when I first saw this, I was, you know, I was mesmerized. This, this is three lines of code. And in nowhere, obviously, have I defined these structures. But they start forming into this, I guess, city of phenomena with very nuanced behavior and repetitive cycles of boxes going from one side to the other. And these pipelines where, uh, uh, you know, white uh, pixels go through. And all of this from just a, a ridiculously small line of code. And so I, I basically, you know, this is what I do. Again, not as a scientist, this is technically useless. Or as of now, all of that stuff is useless. But as an artist, I get to just enjoy it and maybe apply it in, in, in an artistic context. And you know, along the way, I've tried various ways of exploration. This is an example of trying to simulate, uh, not to simulate, sorry. Um, this is uh, an attempt to produce a visual programming language. So, you know, this uh, bit of interface you see here is basically the same thing as, as the algebraic expression. And it's just a mathematical, it's a very simple mathematical formula. You may not know all of the operators, but it's just mathematical operations and instead of using numbers, I'm doing mathematical operations on color. And again, remember, what you're seeing is each pixel being affected by its neighborhood and deciding on what sort of color it should be next. That's it. That's all we're seeing. Um, and you know, there are next steps to this. When you talk about exploration, you can start to think of how can I see, uh, you know, this is, I guess, akin to vast fields of cellular automata programs. Each rectangle here is a different program, slightly different to the one next to it. And what you're actually seeing is that when I move the mouse, I'm also slightly modifying these programs. And I get to just wander in this endless, very epileptic uh, landscape of emergent behavior. And you know, after doing this for, you know, doing this research for something like five years, uh, I've uncovered a fair amount of interesting algorithms, you might call them, uh, interesting to me at least, and behaviors that I think, uh, I don't know, I can't tell you now what, why I think this is worth studying, but I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of sure it is. Um, this is the sort of conviction that you might find artists uh, um, be very involved in, but they don't know why they did something until later in their lives. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of assuming this is the stage that I'm in now. I have very little answers about these things, but quite a lot of interesting questions and somehow the ability to produce tools um, that, would, you know, that allow me to do these explorations. Um, this is another interesting experiment that I did, um, slightly more compound because I've created these algorithms as expressions, you know, as algebraic expressions, I can also treat them as if they were like a DNA structure. And what you're seeing is, is, is a genetic algorithm where I'm letting them evolve uh, on, you know, from, from one generation to the other. And at each iteration, at each generation, I'm actually selecting, it's probably hard to see, but I'm sort of hovering over the ones that I find interesting. And pretty soon you'll see a new generation formed from all these, you know, from kind of mixing them into one another and giving them mutations. And this is an interesting way to explore different algorithms because it's open-ended. There's an infinite number of algorithms 
And just like a, a naturally occurring process, here there's another generation coming. Yeah. So this is a new generation, and all of the members of it are just kind of crossbred from the previous ones that I've selected. So again, this is a way to navigate in this unbelievably large landscape of possible behaviors. And who knows what else is out there? Um, I, no one knows. And this space is filled almost entirely with random nonsense junk. But there are also, they, there must be pockets of, of interesting behaviors that no one has ever seen before because they don't happen to be physically possible. Um, so again, as I'm sure you can see, if you could see my face, I'm very haunted by these questions. Uh, all right, so I guess the end goal for now is to start doing, uh, uh, like establishing an archive, sort of like a database of cellular automata algorithms. And this is what I'm, I'm mostly involved in right now. Um, I'm just convinced that there are interesting behaviors and I, I just set out to explore, collect them, maybe per perform taxonomies, maybe use I don't know, advanced methods like machine learning uh, to, to explore them and to find interesting ones later on. Okay, um, I'll show you, but this is a program I did uh, for, for live performance. Uh, it actually uses several layers of cellular automata that I was able to modify in real time and it manipulates an image coming from a microscope and all of that is also sound reactive. And so this was incorporated in a live performance I did in collaboration with the Musica Nova Ensemble uh, the, in this year's print screen festival. So I'll show a bit of this. You should be able to hear it. If not, I apologize. You recorded. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> it sounds weird. Um, Yeah, I guess creative uses of this. Um, all right. So that was that. Um, how are we with time, Daphna? How are we with time? Uh, we, we have a few, a few minutes okay. extra. I mean, it's all going to yeah. be. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, we have a little bit of extra time. I'm gonna show you two things. One is I'll do a short demo of just a few algorithms that I have lying around here. Uh, let's see. So this is one. Um, just to show you that this is, um, so this is running in the browser and what you see here is this is the algorithm controlling this particular behavior. You can also sort of play around with the mouse. And the way I came up with this one, okay. So again, I, I sort of took an existing algorithm and charted many variations of it. And some of them I found interesting. For instance, this one could be quite interesting. Some of them, you know, you see here. And then you start locating them and you come up with the interesting ones. So let's see if I can find, let's do this one. So as you can see, um, all happening live. So these behaviors, these are called gliders, quite similar to the ones we've seen in Game of Life, but because this is a, a continuous state and full color cellular automata, then, you know, it, you'd get the emergence of much more complex structures, all these processes going back and forth. Um, and again, this is still quite a simple program. I wonder what would happen if you start compounding more and more behaviors and what are the limits of how complex or how interesting these behaviors can get? No one actually knows. This is really uncharted waters. Uh, hmm? Five minutes? Okay. And questions? And a little bit of questions. Like so five minutes. questions in the five minutes? No. 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 Okay. Minutes, no. All right. Cool. So uh, I'll, I will show you a different approach, just so that I don't only talk about cellular automata. This is a work in progress, uh, just a different algorithm that I've been attempting. Um, 
I won't talk too much about it. I'll just kind of let you simmer in it. This is a system sort of I don't know if I should get too far into it, but this behavior is not so much like flocking. It's much more simple than that. But it, it, this is one of the first implementations of it. And if you can see this thing, again, never programmed explicitly. This is also a very short program, maybe like 10 lines of code or something. And just with the rule systems of this world, very interesting things start to emerge. They are almost, uh, they, they almost seem to have their own uh, uh, desires and in, in different adaptations of this program it starts to get very interesting and nuanced behavior again this is not really a simulation of any particular organism it's just dots and lines but they start to form these very nuanced structures and this is uh, th the funny thing about this program it takes it a while to evolve it starts out being just you know a grid of dots and you know, there were like a couple of months way back when I developed this algorithm where I'd have to kind of open the program, go to bed, and then I'd wake up at the morning and, and see, you know, what sort of, what, what I got each time with slightly different parameters. And you get to see very interesting approaches, very interesting tactics for uh, motion. Uh, I won't get too far into it, but there are a lot of things here that are, quite a diverse array of, of approaches. This is a time lapse of how uh, a dense region um, sort of gets these organisms start to kind of form and then they run off. Um, very interesting behavior, almost like looking into a microscope, but again, not a simulation of anything, just a particular way in which dots and lines can connect with one another. Um, this is... Uh, we're getting very bad frame rate here. Again, apologies. Uh, this is, in, in certain aspects, they, they, they become these mega clusters. There should even be, so this one is a time lapse of how two mega clusters um, sort of find one another and then they, uh, um, you can apply a very biological metaphor here. I'm not, I'm not going to. Uh, okay, so that was sort of a quick glance of some of the stuff that I'm interested in. If anyone has any questions, first of all here or later uh, from the Zoom, and just cut me off whenever. Yeah. Uh, well. It's, it's happening very soon, but it's not live yet. Um, it should be, it, 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 the, the goal is to make it more like GLSL Sandbox, like a collaborative place where everyone can log in and just explore. And the idea is that you'd get to name one, you know, just like thinking of, you know, how astronomers, when telescopes started becoming, you know, so the first people, the telescopes got to name all the stars. So the idea is to let yeah, everyone on the web uh, just... Like Absolutely. Um, and I'm inviting anyone to contact me. This is going to be a collaborative project. So everyone here and, and, and elsewhere, uh, I'd be happy to find equally minded people that want to collaborate and, and, and you know, help me explore because it's a lot of work. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you define your research in, in terms of the space and time? What do you mean space and time? Like, uh, uh, we're seeing the, the patterns that there's two dimensions. Yeah. Research has three dimensions. Uh, okay. Aspects of it. Yeah. And when you're talking about movement, uh, what do you think about the uh, mind? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So. Okay, so first of all, I think it's interesting because cellular automata, the question was just for the, for the Zoom, uh, how, how does this all relate in regards to space and time? If you look at something like this, um, 
So cellular automata is quite interesting. It's a discrete model. You're, you're, you're dealing with uh, uh, discrete cells and you're dealing with discrete time steps. So the concept of time is just a transition for, of all cells from their own state to the next one. This is happening 60 times a second, but it doesn't share our concept with time. If you have a fast enough computer, you can make it go faster. And I think it's the same thing with space. These things are abstract. They don't have physical properties. And I think part of my approach is because we've been so focused on simulating physical properties, because, you know, let's face it, most of this stuff is done by scientists for scientists. And what scientists are mostly concerned of is, you know, understanding our physical world. And I think it kind of promotes a bias. And maybe if we start saying, never mind physicality, never mind three dimensions, two dimensions is fine. Let's just explore this space without trying to think of, uh, of our perception of time and our perception of, of physicality or matter. And let's just look at them as abstract structures. So my general approach would be to try and stay away from it for a second, not because I don't like it, uh, but because I think it's maybe hindering us. It's, it's kind of pulling us towards all the stuff that we already know. And maybe there's this, there's this kind of vast ocean of flat, abstract, things that no one is looking at. So I'm, I'm very much into trying to look at, you know, what else is there beside the idea of two minutes. Cool. So that, that's kind of my approach, but I'm, I'm not married to it. This is just, you know, this type of research I think can benefit from this approach. Um, other stuff that I do definitely are more simulation oriented. More questions, maybe from Zoom? Okay, maybe not from Zoom. Or we could just, yeah, yeah. Everything you show me is amazing. Thank you. Uh, I'm from but I wanted to ask about the last one. Uh, so we, we see a video. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, possible to, to run it or manipulate it in real time? Or is it this one? Computational intense. No, you're not seeing it. Which one? The, the last one with the clusters melting together. Oh yeah, it's real-time software. All the stuff that oh. I do is real-time software. Yeah, it's actually very not computational intense. It's 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 linear, because yeah, I won't get into it, but we can talk about this. It's actually a linear algorithm. You can see what you've saw there is like hundreds of thousands of nodes operating in real time, because they don't they don't actually need to look at all the other ones. So it, it's linear computation, but it has a different problem which I've never been able to solve. So, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, there was a question from uh, Ishuai. Yes. Ishuai. Hi. Can Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Very impressive. Uh, it's here. You wrote it from the chat. Oh. Yeah, there Wait. Do you want to ask it anyway? Yeah, I can uh, ask it. Okay. I go can ahead. Ask it. Uh, I really like your work and how you go into depth, discovering different patterns and different uh, automata, the relationship driven by a core algorithm. I really love it. And I think you're actually somehow simulating metaphysical reality because when you show the picture of the microscope and the, cosp uh, and the tiny microscope and some satellite, you can see similarity of the patterning. And that always makes me wonder why things are like that. Is there a potential energy distribution patterning underlying our life or our right. energy? So I think it's scientific, it's not orthodox science, but it's new, modern, and very audacious, innovative science. So I really enjoy it. And my question is, yeah. are, you co are you coding it in shader or you're using which yeah. program? So, so my, my programming, so the question, he was flattering me a lot, so thank you for that. Um, but the question was, do I use shader programming? Uh, yeah, so the, the framework that you saw, I don't know if you can still see my screen, but this is all using WebGL. So, uh, the, yeah, it's, it's JavaScript and WebGL. Um, this is a platform that I've been using. Again, if people want to help me, there is a GitHub page for the actual, it's a JavaScript library, um, and it uses WebGL. And, you know, if you, if you don't know WebGL, uh, I'm, I'm saying to, to other people, you're basically programming things on the graphics card. And mm -hmm. so that enables you to do things very, very fast because um, it's parallel processing. So very interesting stuff uh, if people want to get into that shader program. Yes, it is shader program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
I guess. Uh, okay. I'm going to thank everyone anyway. If there are any more questions, I can answer. But thank you. Thank you so much.